Good evening, everyone, and welcome. One thing that I've realized during this time of social distancing and online services is how much of a back and forth there is between uh, the minister and the congregation, which is clearly missing at this point. Uh, from the singing to the preaching, even reciting the Apostles' Creed together, there is a, an interaction during the worship service. Leading worship is not just uh, flipping on autopilot and going through the motions, it's worship, and we do it together, and that makes this time hard, uh, and it makes us look forward to being together once again. Tonight, the theme of our worship service is God's providence and our response to His providence, how nothing comes to us by chance, but all things come to us from His fatherly hand, and how in light of that we can be patient through adversity, how we can be thankful in prosperity, and we can face what is to come with confidence knowing that nothing in all of creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our call to worship this evening is Psalm 107. Psalm 107, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble. 
and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we bless you, O Lord, with all that is within us. We bless your holy name. And forget not all your benefits. Lord, you forgive all our sins. You heal all our diseases. You redeem our life from the pit and crown us with steadfast love and mercy. You satisfy us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, we ask that you will now fill us with your spirit so that we can celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth with reverence and awe blessing you, the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People of God, hear this greeting and this blessing from your Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We continue worshiping together by turning in our Trinity Psalter hymnals to Psalm 92b. Psalm 92b, it is good to sing your praises. This evening, we profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you're unfamiliar with this creed, you can find it in your Trinity Psalter hymnals on page 851, or you'll see it on the screen in front of you as well. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We respond by turning to number 255, number 255 as we sing together day by day and with each passing moment. This evening, the psalm we'll be looking at together is Psalm 70, Psalm 70. So I invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to Psalm 70. And there we read, beginning with verse 1, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. In Mark 15, verse 29, 
we read these words, And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. It's because of that passage and its connection with Psalm 70 that the church has used this psalm to remember Christ's suffering on the cross. God the Father did delay in rescuing His Son during the crisis of the cross, but only for a short while. Since Jesus' prayer to be rescued was heard on the day of resurrection, because of that, because His prayer for deliverance was heard, because Christ rose again from the dead, we can be confident that our prayers are also heard. Our prayers for deliverance make make haste, O God, to deliver us. From this psalm, we also learn that it's appropriate to ask God to act quickly, to act quickly on our behalf when circumstances call for it. We may become anxious because our, our prayer may go unanswered for a time, And that's when we continue to turn to the Lord in prayer and cry out to our Lord to come and deliver us. We're going to sing Psalm 70 together at this time, so I invite you to turn in your Trinity Psalter hymnals to Psalm 70, Make Haste, O God, to Save Me. time, let's join our hearts together in our congregational prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, make haste, O God, to deliver us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Let those who seek our life be put to shame and confusion. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor those who delight in our hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame. Lord, you continually care for us and watch over us in such a way that neither health nor sickness, prosperity nor poverty, not even a hair can fall from our head apart from your will. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from your fatherly hand. And we know that you work all things for the good of those who love you. As your people, O Lord, you see the needs and the hurts of our members. Our lives have come to a standstill. Self-quarantine, isolation, loneliness, and even frustration. And so we ask that you will stand close to anyone who is struggling. Rescue those who thought they were treading water fine, and now feel like they're drowning. Continue to bless those who are healing and recovering. We ask for your peace and comfort on those who are facing procedures and operations. 
Lord, please grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that he may teach us to know truly our miseries and to bear patiently the difficulties we face. Increase our faith by your Holy Spirit. Build and grow our faith that we may become more and more united with Christ. We pray for those in our medical community. We think of the doctors and the nurses and the staff in our hospitals and care centers. We pray that you will strengthen them as they care for and treat those who are suffering. And we ask that you will bless the efforts of those who are striving to keep this virus from spreading. Guide those who are doing research, searching for treatment options and vaccines. Please work through the doctors and the caregivers to bring health and healing in our lives. Lord, we lift up in prayer those who are the most vulnerable to this virus. Please keep them safe and healthy according to your will. Hold those who are suffering in your loving arms of mercy and assure them, even in this time of of isolation and social distancing, that they are not alone. Give them the courage and the faith for all that is to come and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, this evening we also bring before you the, the economic impact and the unanswered questions. Those whose hours are cut back or are furloughed or laid off or unemployed. Please give us the patience we need in this moment, trusting you to provide as you always do. And please lead to better times, those of us who do not have work right now, who are worried about family finances and who wonder what the future holds. Let the coming weeks and months hold new opportunities for work and ways for us to use the gifts and the skills that you have blessed us with. Lord, you alone see us as we are. And so we ask that you will continue to nurture us according to our needs. Use these difficult times to strengthen our faith and our hope and our love. Minister to us according to our hurts. And heal us in all those places where you see that we are broken. And whatever happens in our lives, or whatever we're going through at this present moment, We still praise you and worship you. You give and you take away, and we bless your name, O Lord. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great, but we are poor and needy. Hasten to us, O God. You are our help and our deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Answer us, O God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This evening, as we get ready to turn our attention to God's word, we're going to sing together number 257. Number 257, Children of the Heavenly Father. And we'll sing verses 1, 3, five and six of number 257.
this evening, we continue working our way through the Heidelberg Catechism, and we are looking at Lord's Day 10. Lord's Day 10, question and answer 27 and 28. You can find that on page 876 in your Trinity Psalter hymnals, or you'll also see it on the screen in front of you as well. I'll read each of these questions, and we can respond together with the answers. And so first, question and answer 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father, that no creature will separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. Now I invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to Romans chapter 8. Our passage this evening will be Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. And once you found that, we'll also be looking at Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 33. So Romans 8 and Matthew 10. And as we get ready to turn our attention to God's word, let's ask him for his blessing. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, as we now open up your word together, it's our prayer that you will fill us with your spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. We pray also that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your incomparably great power for us who believe. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18, and let's pay careful attention because this is God speaking his holy word to us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, 
because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now turning over to Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 26. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim claim in the housetops, on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of our Lord remains forever. People of God, from the grain of sand tossed by the ocean waves to the stars in the farthest reaches of the universe, God is like the conductor of an orchestra. He is at work directing each part of his creation. Nothing moves without his command. Nothing happens outside of his control. He commands every rain shower and snowfall. He tells the flower buds to bloom and the ocean waves to roll. No one, not even the angels in heaven, can stop God's work in our world. Every minute of every day, God holds the universe together by the power of His Word. Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us He upholds the universe by the Word of His power. God is keeping His creation steady so that everything works according to His plan. Rocks are still hard just like God planned them to be. And the water still drips and drops, 
just like it was designed. In him, all things hold together. We live in a a world of order, a world of predictability, and we often take that for granted. When we go to bed at night, we fully expect that the sun will come up the next day. When we step out of our beds in the morning, we don't think twice about our feet touching the floor and then us standing up. We never think twice about the gravity that's holding us to the ground. We don't worry about all of a sudden uh, disintegrating and the molecules of our bodies dispersing because we are held together. We live in a world of order and predictability because that's the way God created it. And that's the way he sustains it and continually creates it by his providence. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. What do we mean when we profess that together? Last time we talked about God the Father as the creator in the beginning, creating all things out of nothing. We had the seven points each day of creation. And now tonight, we go on to explore God's providence. Zacharias Ursinus, uh, one of the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism, explains it like this. Intimately connected with the doctrine of the creation of the world is the subject of the providence of God, which is nothing else than a continuation of the creation. And so for us to realize that God is actively holding each molecule in life, each molecule of our life together, changes the way we look at life. Realizing that God upholds everything as with his hand changes our perspective on life, on reality. Because of God's providence, whatever lies ahead, we know that God will be with us with his ever-present power, upholding all things as with his fatherly hand. We know that all things come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. We believe that God is in control of everything, the good and the bad, for his glory and our salvation. John Calvin, in his Institutes, describes the benefits or the blessings of providence in our life as gratitude, patience, and freedom from worry. And the Catechism mentions these three as well. The practical application of God's providence in your life, what God's providence means for you right now is that we can be patient. We can be patient when things go against us. Patient during the hard times because God is in control. It's all happening according to his will. It also means that we can be thankful during the good times. And we can be confident because we know that no matter what lies ahead, good or bad, God is still in control. And we can face the future with that confidence and hope because of God's providence. We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and we can face what is to come with confidence, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And those will be our three points this evening. First of all, we can be patient. How do we respond to the difficulties we face How do we respond to the struggles we go through, especially at this point in our lives, at this time? As I watch the news each day, they they have little segments. In light of the the stress you're facing at this time, and in light of this COVID uh, crisis, uh, try meditation. Try these these breathing routines to to try to calm yourself down and and lower your heart rate or your stress level or, or try these scented candles. Or someone I know turns to, to bacon and Oreo cookies to try to help. 
How do we respond to the difficulties we face? Well, the answer that God's Word gives us is be patient. Patience is the response. Paul is telling us, God's Word is is telling us that what you are facing right now, Romans 8 verse 9, what you are facing right now, what you are going through presently, it's not even worth comparing to the future glory that will be revealed. And all of a sudden, we are given the bigger picture. All of a sudden, our perspective is eternal. All of a sudden, the right here, right now sufferings that we are going through are only temporary. And in light of that blip on the screen, we can be patient through them. In light of eternity, social distancing for a few weeks isn't that big of a deal. In light of the glory that is yours in Jesus Christ forever, the difficulties we face right here and right now don't even compare. This too shall pass. And as it does, we are patient. Romans 8 verse 24 through 25, For in this hope we are saved, we were saved, Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The dominant theme of of Romans 8 is victory over sin. Christ's victory over sin and death, and how that victory, how Christ's victory is also our victory as well through faith in Him. Even death itself has no victory over us who place our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why in verse 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in to us. I want you to think with me for just a moment of some of the the biblical examples that we have of this kind of patience that's being described, of, of waiting on the Lord even during the difficult times, even during the hard times, having patience during the times of suffering, knowing that God is in control. We can think of of Joseph. You can think of his life being sold into into slavery, hauled off, and then thrown into prison. And, And as he looks back, as we look at his story, we see how God worked even that difficult suffering situation out for his glory. Joseph even said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God works all things for the good of those who love him. Verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, God is in control. His will be done, and we can rest in that, and we can be patient in that. Think about David. He's another example of of patience through suffering. You have the suffering of Job even, everything that Job went through. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Uh, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord be praised. And all of these examples, one after another throughout Scripture, show a turning away from the trouble and turning to the Lord, remembering God's providence, remembering that God is still in control and resting in that. If God could take the painful moments of suffering that Joseph and and David and Job and even Jesus went through, in his life and his death, if God can take what they went through and work it for good, then we can be patient and confident that he will do the same for us. 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Because we know that God is in control, we can be patient when things go against us. Because we know that there is a reason for what's happening, even though we may not have the answer or we may not know the reason why, we know that God does. Because of God's providence, there is a reason for this diagnosis from the doctor. Because of God's providence, there is a reason for this painful time my family is going through right now. For the loss that I'm experiencing. For the suffering that never seems to end. For me not feeling like I have anyone to talk to, for this lonely feeling that I have, for this darkness that I feel inside. And it is in these moments that we, as God's children in Christ, are called to be patient as we rest on Him, rest on His providence, on Him upholding all things with His fatherly hand. Now, just when we thought being patient during the hard times was hard enough, Paul takes things a step further in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, when he says, rejoice always, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstance. And at this point, you might be thinking, okay, it was enough to say, uh, be patient when I'm experiencing the most difficult situation in my life. And now Paul's taking things even further and saying that I need to be thankful, that I need to be joyful during these trials of my life. That's taking things too far. And then Paul goes on in verse 18 to add, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, to always rejoice, to constantly pray, in everything give thanks. And we might uh, try to soften uh, the severity of those commands. Well, do your best to be joyful in every, and really try hard to be thankful in all circumstances. But these commands are clear and absolute. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstance. And then he strengthens those commands by saying, for this is God's will for you. How is this patience, how is this joyfulness, this thankfulness even possible in the face of suffering? And the answer is only in Christ Jesus. What we see at this point is that because God is in control of everything, even during the pandemics of our life, we can still be patient. We can still be joyful, prayerful, thankful because of who we are in Christ, not because of the situation we find ourselves in. It's not the events of our life or the circumstance we find ourselves in that makes us patient or joyful or prayerful or thankful, but rather it is who we are in Christ. And the overflow of who we are in Christ impacts the situation that we're currently in. That's why we can be patient when things go against us. And secondly, Why we can be thankful when things go well. That's our second point this evening, be thankful. Now, at first glance, it might be tempting to think that this is the easiest one to live out. Oh, oh, be thankful uh, when things go well. It seems easy to be thankful when things go well, but we need to be realistic with this point as well. I mean, parents, you know how difficult it is to, to help and teach your children to say thankful. They need to be reminded. They, they tear into that gift from grandpa and grandma, and you have to remind them, okay, say thank you. Well, 
when it comes to our relationship with God, sometimes we tend to act a little bit childish. How often have we experienced success and we chalked it up to our own hard work? Or maybe we feel like we deserve what we have. We've we've earned it after all. Or I'm entitled to this. Instead of recognizing that all of this is coming to us from His fatherly hand. When things are going really well, think about how easy it is for us to forget to thank God. How easy it was for us to forget to thank Him for our health. Or that we can gather together as a congregation to worship. You can think of the lepers who were healed, but only one came back to thank Him. And as we think about being thankful because of God's providence, we need to know what God's providence is. Boys and girls, I want you to think about someone building a house, a carpenter, and he's, and he's working on this house, and he's, he's cutting the boards, and he's nailing them together, and slowly but surely this house is built, and once that house is finished, what happens to the carpenter? Well, he leaves and and the family moves into that home, right? Well, by comparison, when God built the world, he constructed it, he built it all out of absolutely nothing, which we looked at last time, but God didn't leave. He didn't walk away and then let us move in. No, God is still working on this house. He created it and he built it and he keeps on building and working. And we get to live in the world that God is working on. And that's why we can be thankful for everything because it all comes from God. Question and answer 27, what do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God. Ever-present power, remember that. By which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, so you think of the 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 leaves of the tree that are coming this springtime and all of the blades of grass, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty. All things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. And that's why we can be patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity. Our joy and our praise and our thankfulness is the overflow of who we are in Jesus Christ. And what that means is that our joy and our praise and our thankfulness is not dependent on the circumstance or situation that we find ourselves in. Our joy and our thankfulness And our praise is not dependent on what happens to us from the outside, but rather on what's going on with us on the inside. And what I mean by that is who we are in Christ. And it's that joy, that thankfulness, that praise that overflows into the situation. 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the key to understanding the the thankfulness that's being described here. Not a thankfulness because of what we have or because of the circumstance we're in, Instead, it's a thankfulness that comes from who we are in Christ. What do I mean by that? The neighbors of early Christians, early Christians who were being persecuted for their faith, they couldn't figure out why these Christians were so joyful. 
I mean, these Christians, they had no reason, given the present situation, to be joyful. Uh, They were harassed, they were persecuted, they were detested by society because of their faith, and they still had joy. And their joy wasn't a joy in spite of hard times and afflictions. It was a joy because they were afflicted. So here we're taking things to the next level. It's not only overflowing in joy because of who we are in Christ and it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. They, in spite of their afflictions, or considered it joy to face those afflictions. Acts 5 Verse 41, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Joy comes from being in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it overflows into the circumstances of life. Always rejoice constantly pray and everything give thanks. Paul's rejoicing, his praying, his thanking is grounded in his knowledge of all that God is doing. And because all things come from God's fatherly hand, we can be patient during the hard times. We can be thankful during the good times. And third and finally, we can be confident for the future. That's our third and our final point this evening. Be confident. God's providence encourages us in our confidence and in our hope for the future, for what lies ahead. There is no reason to worry. There's no reason to fear what lies ahead because God has that in the palm of His hand as well. Matthew 10 which we read earlier, Matthew 10, verse uh, 26 through 33. In this section, uh, Matthew is describing the, the right, well, it's actually Jesus, is describing the right and the wrong ways to, to be afraid. We're told uh, three different times uh, the wrong way to fear. So, verse 26, he says, uh, have no fear. Verse 28 and do not fear. Verse 31, fear not. So Jesus is about to send his disciples out. They're about to to go, and they're going to be facing persecution, and his encouragement with them is to not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Have no fear. Do not fear. Fear not. Don't be afraid because of what man can do to you. It's about having the right and the wrong type of fear. So don't be afraid of man, because what's the worst that man can do to you? Well, he can kill you. That's it. He can kill the body. Instead, the right kind of fear is a fear of the Lord, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So this is a a fear of God's holy wrath against evil, punishing the body and the soul in hell. So So there is no reason to fear because of God's amazing power. You don't need to fear man. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Fear not because you have a fear of God and the His amazing power that's being described here. And so we have this awesome expression of God's power in judgment, his ability to destroy body and soul in the, in the fires of hell. And then we go right from that awesome, amazing, enormous expression of God's power to a seemingly insignificant small expression of God's power, but yet another expression of His power nonetheless. The way that God expresses His power in His creation with sparrows, of all things. One penny, two sparrows, And even though these little birds are so small and so cheap, not even one of them falls to the ground, not even one of them dies, apart from God's will, 
apart from his plan. Boys and girls, remember how I told you that God is the one building everything and he's still working on it. Well, one way that we see God at work is that not even a little bird dies apart from God's plan. Nothing slips through God's fingers. He upholds and controls all things. Not one sparrow dies apart from God the Father's hand. He upholds all things. So on the one hand, on the one extreme, you have the eternal punishment for sin, soul and body in hell. That doesn't happen just by chance or by fortune, but according to his holy will. And the opposite extreme is a sparrow doesn't die by chance or misfortune or because it just happened to fly into a window. It's all according to God. God's plan. Only by his leading and governing of his holy will. Nothing happens in this world without God's orderly arrangement. And if a sparrow isn't small enough for you, if a sparrow isn't insignificant enough for you, then Jesus goes on to say that the very hairs on your head are numbered. You yourselves don't even notice or even know how many hairs you have on your head. You don't notice when one or two fall out, and you're definitely not keeping a record or a tally, adding and subtracting as they grow or as they fall. I mean, experts say the typical human has probably around 100,000 to 500,000 hairs on their head, and God the Father knows the exact number of the hairs on your head right now. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from his will. Now, if a hair isn't small enough for you or insignificant enough for you, what about something smaller than a hair, like a virus? That's within God's control as well. All according to his will, all things held by his fatherly hand health and sickness, prosperity and poverty. God the Father who watches over us with his fatherly care has a complete knowledge of the most insignificant information about each one of his children. And the reasoning is that if God cares about a sparrow and that little bird doesn't die apart from his will, if God even knows how many hairs are on your head, then you don't have to be afraid because you are worth a whole lot more than a whole lot of sparrows. Romans reminds us that there is nothing, nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of that, because we know that no matter what lies ahead, good or bad, that God is still in control, we can face the future with confidence and hope. We are called, as those who are in Christ Jesus, to be patient, to be thankful, and to be confident. Whatever we are going through now, the trials and the difficulties, we are patient. And when we think about all that is ours in Christ, all of the blessings poured out onto us by God's grace, we 
are thankful. And when we think about what tomorrow will bring, or the next day, or the day after that, we are confident. Because all things come to us, not by chance, but from our Father's hand. And that's why we can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity. And we can face what is to come with confidence, knowing that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for all that is ours in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that whatever we go through, we can be patient in adversity, that we can be thankful for the many blessings you pour out onto us, and that we can face what is to come with confidence and hope, knowing that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from your love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our song of application this evening is number 526. Number 526, as we sing together, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. People of God, hear this blessing from your Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.